Uh, I'm James, I'm a part of the Binance team. And so just before we start, we're just going to go through a couple of uh, our housekeeping sort of rules. Um, so for this masterclass, we'll have a Q&A session after our speaker's presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone who has submitted a question before the class. And during the Q&A session, Nick and Marina and I well, will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, finally, don't forget to stick around for our announcement of the giveaway winners. Um, so before we move to the presentation, we're just going to run through, um, for people who may be new to Binance Australia, the steps on how to sign up and deposit AUD via PayID OSCO on the Binance Australia platform. So just bear with me one second. All right, hopefully they can see that. Mm -hmm. All right, yep, great. you got it. Thank you. So how to sign up on the desktop, so PC or Mac. Oops. You're just going to go to our binance.com dot, excuse me, binance.com slash en dash au. Um, and you just type in your email address or phone number and register now. Make sure to have your Australian government ID ready. You also need to upload the front and back of the documents as well as a selfie to get going. Um, then you have all the information come back, we'll get you verified and you'll be able to deposit AUD via PayID OSCO on the desktop. So again, back onto the homepage now that you're logged into your account and you're just gonna deposit AUD. Um, follow really simple process here, enter the desired amount, select continue. And then you're gonna complete the PayID transfer using your mobile bank app or internet banking. So I'll show you that side just a little bit after. Um, and then once your PayID transfer has been made and came into the account, your deposit will be reflected in AUD wallet in your uh, Binance Australia account. So you're also uh, able to deposit via the PayID OSCO on the app. Um, so you're going to download the Binance app for iOS or Android. And on the front page there, you can see highlighted, uh, you just hit deposit AUD. Um, so then you want to enter the desired AUD deposit amount and click continue and copy your unique pay ID email address by tapping on the yellow copy icon. So you can see that just on the right of the unique finance pay ID address. And so this is something you would have to do on the desktop as well. So you're getting this information and then bringing it across to say your CBA or ANZ app or something like this. And so you're gonna hit pay someone and always make sure to do via email address. A lot of users would do organization ID or something along these lines. We wanna select email address and that's where you're going to paste in your unique pay ID. Hit next, put in the amount, enter any description and hit next and send that one. And so once that transfer has been cleared by your bank, um, your deposit will be reflected in your AUD wallet on your Binance app. So super simple. We uh, One of the easiest exchanges to deposit AUD on, get verified. Um, super, super, super simple process there. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to jump on the Telegram. We have heaps of FAQs on the main page. Um, so all the information is there as well. So, all righty, let's get to the masterclass. So joining us tonight, we have Nick Christie and Marina Kovalenko from Kovatax as our guest speakers. You guys want to say hello? Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to our masterclass. I'm so excited to be sharing our insights with you tonight. Hi guys, uh, really good to, to be here um, and yeah, we're really excited to dig in a little bit to some of the tax uh, issues that you're all facing and hopefully this will help you, you know, get some insights and understanding around what your obligations are and, and some strategies as well on things you can do to, to maybe get better tax outcomes um, or approaches that you can take. So we're excited to get into that a little bit later. Awesome. So for those of you who don't know Marina and Nick, they are the co-founders of Covertax. Covertax is a tech-driven, excuse me, tech-driven accounting firm for businesses, self-managed super funds, and investors in the cryptocurrency sector in Australia. Marina is the co-founder at Covertax. She is a chartered tax advisor with extensive experience in accounting, audit, and tax. She's involved in ongoing work around the future of tax legislation and its application to blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, Nick is also a co-founder at Covertax, whose focus is on technical solutions that streamline and automate accounting and compliance tasks. Nick has extensive knowledge of software development, blockchain technology, and a strong understanding um, excuse me, of the tax treatment in Australia. As an avid crypto investor himself, he puts the tax theory into practice with investments in cryptocurrency and blockchain projects. 
So yes, thank you for joining us tonight, guys. Um, more than welcome to start sharing your screen now and get underway with your presentation. Um, let's do it. Okay, so it should be sharing now. Are we good, James? Yeah, perfect. All good on my end. Awesome. All right. Okay, yeah, welcome everyone. So first off, uh, I mean, we're not doing any tax advice for you tonight or legal advice or financial advice. So there's actually no advice being given. Um, <laughs> Why did we turn up tonight? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, this presentation is really to introduce a lot of the concepts to you. So the things we're going to be covering, you know, it's a chat, it's a discussion. Uh, we are going to present some facts and specific circumstances as well. So, you know, it's then from this, it's, it's up to you if you can, you know, do your own research, uh, take these guidelines and apply them yourself to your specific circumstances, or you may look to a tax advisor. So uh, qualified tax accountant uh, or an accounting firm, or possibly a tax lawyer. Um, or possibly you can engage with the ATO as well to get specific advice for your circumstances. Uh, because really to provide that level of advice requires us to look at your situation and the specific facts, the specific circumstances, and then tell you, you know, how our tax legislation is interpreted in those circumstances and applied to your situation. That's right, because it's so complex and tax is really complex in Australia. So you have to seek the advice um, for yourself as an individual. We have to consider your facts and circumstances, which is not quite possible tonight. So you have to watch this landscape as well, because whatever we say today can be not actually appropriate in a couple of months if the, something changes in the legislation. That's right. So if you're, you know, right now, uh, we've prepared this presentation and it's accurate on the best guidelines that we have. But if you are reviewing this in the future and coming back to this video uh, or seeing it at some, you know, a recording at some time in the future, uh, the things we discussed, uh, some of the outcomes may have changed by then. So it is something to keep in mind. So, you know, I've got a friend and he's got a pretty good crypto portfolio. And uh, he's been in this space for a while and he's made a lot of investments. He's got a good portfolio. And he tells me, you know, he doesn't have to pay any tax, right? Because it's cryptocurrency and you can't track it. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, maybe ethically, I shouldn't have to pay tax on this, right? Do you think that's, a, you know, sort of a reasonable approach for investors in the cryptocurrency space, Marina? I think your mate, uh, you have to talk to him and explain. <laughs> because the ATO uh, has been introduced uh, the data matching program. And from 2019, they've been actually precisely watching this space. And with the time, the ATO gets more resources and getting more information. And eventually, it will cover every little exchange in Australia and every little service that someone provides. So you need to know that the data matching program is already working and the ATO already obtained a lot of information from the larger Australian exchanges. And as you can imagine, anyone who wants to stay in business in Australia would actually follow the guidelines from the ATO and would have to uh, cooperate and collaborate. Uh, there is a big um, uh, organization that is actually watching more uh, serious events, which are like uh, all about the tax fraud and evasion, and that calls J5. So the J5 is um, a union of uh, five countries, which is including Australia, the US, Canada, Netherlands, and the UK, all those highly regulated jurisdictions. And hopefully no one tonight that is on um, our masterclass has to know anything about this, because this is more about serious involvement in the, trying to move money away from Australia or from other countries. So these countries are exchanging information on cryptocurrency. Um, also, the ATO have been actually sending out letters uh, to Australian um, crypto investors and traders, and roughly about 350,000 been already sent for 2018 financial year. Same will happen with 2019, and eventually it will come to 2020. 
after 17 May. Uh, the ATO also does audits and reviews, and we've seen some. So what it means, the review is sort of like a shorter audit where they can review a particular item, let's say only capital gains on your tax return. An audit is more uh, higher scope and that may involve like the full audit of your tax return of each item. Um, if you receive this letter from the ATO, you will have to have to respond to them within 28 days. So if you have not done the right thing, if you did not declare your cryptocurrency, you have only 28 days to reconcile everything and rectify the issue. Mm. Do you think it's a, you know, a lot of people say it's quite difficult to, to do the cryptocurrency tax. You know, they've got a lot of transactions. It's hard to put together. Do you think it's a good strategy just to ignore and just let the ATO, you know, decide what tax you should pay? Is it really a good strategy for people to follow? Uh, cryptocurrency can be really complex to reconcile. This is true, especially if you're a curious person like myself or Nick, uh, when we jump on every little service out there and we know how it works and we sign up everywhere. So we have mi millions of accounts. This is, can be really involving, uh, though that would be not a reasonable approach if you say to the ATO that, oh, you know, it's too hard, too complex, no one knows how to figure out and leave it out and wait for the default assessment, because this is an eventually what may happen. The ATO will issue the default assessment. Default assessment is not a good thing because what the ATO will always uh, look for and find for you is uh, your income. So your proceeds, if we're talking about investing, they will definitely have that data and they will be uh, pushing this information on you and saying that, okay, we found this accessible income but they are not necessarily will be tracking and trying to find your expenses or cost base if you're an investor. So this is in your best interest to reconcile your portfolio and to actually declare the right amount that you calculated. Uh, that would be the best approach. Mm. So tax does apply to cryptocurrency investments. It's actually in the best interest for the taxpayer to, to, to put their tax records together and declare. And if you don't, the ATO does currently have, you know, the data matching program and the data sharing programs in place uh, where they're already flagging Australian investors who have investments in cryptocurrency. Right, I mean, what, uh, like, what do we actually have to do as a taxpayer uh, in Australia? If I'm a crypto investor. What are my obligations? Right. This is my, uh, one of the most exciting parts is um, you can see that a lot of people know their obligations as a taxpayer, which is nice and the right thing to do. But many of us actually don't know our rights as a taxpayer. And I'm always excited to bring them back. Because when you deal with the ATO, uh, you know, you don't live in an ideal world and things can happen. And sometimes you have to exercise your rights. So about obligations, um, everyone must be like truthful, you have to keep your records, of course. You have to take reasonable care, lodge everything by due date, pay everything by the due date, and be cooperative, which is, uh, it, eventually it means that if you get audited, you must be cooperative uh, with the ATO. But when it comes to the rights, uh, what exactly you can actually have as a taxpayer? So the ATO must treat you as an honest person until otherwise, and they have to accept that you may have a choice to have a tax agent or another professional in tax, like to represent you. And this is a great thing. And of course, uh, you probably heard about uh, uh, Free of Information Act. And I wonder if you know what it means for you. So Freedom of Information Act actually gives you additional right so as a taxpayer, you can request an, any information that the ATO holds about you. And that can be exciting. It's not for everyone. You may not have to exercise this right ever, but in some complex situations or objections and disputes with the ATO is actually a really exciting news to have because you can request, a like you have to be specific about what you are requesting 
and there could be some small costs uh, uh, associated with this. But you can obtain any information that the ATO holds on you, including cryptocurrency, and that can be exciting. You also uh, have the right to request the ATO to explain their decision to you. Like, for example, if you get penalties, you have the right to know why you are penalized and all other issues. Um, you also have the right for the review, like it would be an independent review of what the ATO made as a choice or decided on your case. And you can also have a right of complaint, which is maybe the last uh, thing to do, but sometimes it's also very helpful. Mm. Yeah, it's not just about your obligations to pay tax. It's also certain rights you have as a taxpayer in Australia so that you can meet those obligations that you have. So, you know, there is some support from the ATO to do that. And there's also the advisors that you can engage with to make sure that you are treating your tax correctly. So let's like jump into a real life example. Uh, so for the majority of investors uh, who hold cryptocurrency, so that's someone who's purchasing cryptocurrency and holding it for investment, you're going to fall into something which is called capital gains tax. So when you dispose of your cryptocurrency in the future for some amount, you will make a gain or a loss, and that will be your capital gain or loss, and the outcome from that will need to be declared. Some way or another, it's going to form part of your assessable income. So this can get quite complicated, but we're going to go through some very simple examples so that you can understand it from a high level, what the general concepts are. Because once you understand the general concepts, you'll be able to make better decisions yourself as well with your investments. You know, what are the implications when I do eventually sell? Or should I just hold for a little bit longer? You know, what would those outcomes be for me? So we're going to go through the first example. This is about as simple as it can get. It's called the buy and hold strategy. All right. So let's do this example. It's the 1st of July. Um, and uh, Joe, Joe has 10,000 Australian dollars. It's sitting as cash in his bank account. And Joe decides uh, for whatever reason he has that he wants to make investments into cryptocurrency. So he takes his $10,000 Australian and he deposits it into an exchange such as Binance. And he makes a purchase. He purchases 0 0.1 Bitcoin for his 10,000 Australian dollars. So he now has a quantity of 0 0.1 Bitcoin he no longer has any Australian dollars and that's his purchase. So he has quantity 0 0.1. The market value of the Bitcoin was $10,000 for that 0 0.1 Bitcoin when he purchased it. So that's the value of that parcel for that quantity. And he also has a cost base. Cost base is an uh, important uh, variable in the calculations. That's basically how much you spent to acquire that parcel of Bitcoin, the 0 0.1 Bitcoins in this case. And Joe follows very simple strategy, he basically does nothing. He just holds his Bitcoin. So he doesn't, um, you know, convert the Bitcoin for another cryptocurrency. He doesn't sell it. He doesn't send it to his mates or, or gift it to someone else. He just holds the Bitcoin and he holds it for extended period of time. So now it's the end of financial year. It's the 30th of June, 2021. And Joe's wondering, you know, what are the tax outcomes going to be for me? Because in that meantime, the value of Bitcoin that he holds has gone up significantly. The market value is now fifty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So this is a you know great outcome for him, but he's wondering you know how is he going to have to pay tax on this? What are the tax outcomes? So let's look at it and, and see what happens. So he still has zero point one quantity of Bitcoin. The market value has increased significantly. That parcel is now worth 50000 That means if he sold the Bitcoin, he will probably get somewhere around $50,000 for it, right? The cost base is still the same. It hasn't changed because that's what he originally purchased the unit of 0 0.1 Bitcoin for. And he has what we call an unrealized gain that he's sitting on of 40000 So he's so a hodler. He's a hodler. That's right. He's got the hodl strategy, Okay. He's held that for this entire period of time. So let's see what his tax outcomes are going to be. Right. Tax outcomes are essentially no outcomes, all right? There is no capital gain in this example. He just held and he held and he never disposed, all right? So there's no capital gain. There's no assessable income that he will have to declare. That's exciting. That's ultimately the best uh, outcome for tax. 
Uh, this is a, you know, this is one of the most effective strategies you can have to not pay tax, right? You can just hold, and he can hold this for as long as he wants to. He can hold it for his lifetime, and if he never disposes, you know, he will never have a capital gains event that he would have to calculate the capital gain and declare it. So a lot of people ask this question, you know, the, the value has gone up and it's now the end of financial year. Do I have any tax implications of this scenario? And most of the time there will be no tax outcomes, no accessible income that you'll have to declare. But there are some important considerations where people sometimes go wrong in this strategy. So you can't sell, okay? You have to hold it. But you also can't have any other types of disposals. So you can't do that gifting. Uh, you can't uh, send it to someone else, for example. And the most common example is you can't have a crypto to crypto transaction. So if you take that 0.1 Bitcoin and then you decide to convert it or swap it or exchange it for another cryptocurrency, that will be a disposal event for the Bitcoin that you held because you no longer have it. You had 0.1 Bitcoin, you swapped it for Ethereum or Litecoin or whatever it is, and now you have zero Bitcoin. So you completely disposed of it. And that's where you'll have a capital gain or a capital loss, and you'll have to calculate the outcomes. Nick, you would be excited. We have so many comments, and especially I like one from Satoshi Nakamoto. He says that never sell, just hold <laughs> That's a good description that's, for this. That's right. It's the perfect description for this strategy. It's the, it's the HODL strategy. It's very tax efficient, but of course it means you can't sell. So if there's not going to be any you know, opportunity for you to time the markets or rebalance your portfolio or any of those events. So it's not always practical to hold forever. Uh, for some people, it can be their strategy. And it's, uh, you know, as you can see, it is a tax efficient outcome because you won't have that disposal event. All right. So for most people, they probably do want to sell at some point. So let's go through a very simple example for that scenario. So it's the, it's the same scenario. Joe's got his 10,000 Australian dollars, right? He decides he wants to invest in cryptocurrency. So he, he deposits his, his Australian dollars. He makes a purchase of Bitcoin. Once again, he has 0 0.1 Bitcoin, market value 10,000, cost base 10,000. Now he waits. He waits for some period of time. Uh, the value of uh, the Bitcoin that he has has gone up in value um, and he decides that he wants to sell. So he, he puts in his sell order. He now has uh, zero Bitcoin because he sold all of them and he now has a balance of 50,000 Australian dollars. So he has proceeds of $50,000 from the sale of this Bitcoin. This is important because his proceeds is going to go into the calculation for his capital gains. And now it's the end of financial year as well. So there's no immediate um, you know, concern for him to declare this amount and, and have to lodge his tax. But now it's come end of financial year and he does have to meet his tax obligations. So he started with 10,000, he purchased the Bitcoin, he disposed of the Bitcoin, and now he's left with 50,000. Let's look at what the tax outcomes will be for Joe. So this is the calculation that we use. This is the formula for capital gains. We take the proceeds from the sale. So that sale event, that's the disposal event. That's really important. That's where the, the gain has been made. He sold the 0 0.1 Bitcoin, and now he has 50,000 in proceeds. From the 50,000, you get to subtract your cost base. So the cost base for that parcel was 10,000. So that reduces the gains that you'll have to pay, and you result in 40,000 capital gain. That's the outcome. That's this capital bad. gain... Yeah, it's not too bad. He's made a good gain, right? But he will have to pay tax on this. So that 40000 forms part of his accessible income. So that will go, you know, add on to your salary or wages or you maybe have some dividends or, you know, income from investment property. All of that gets lumped together. You add your gains from your cryptocurrency, you know, disposals as well, and that will be taxed. Uh, in this example, Joe's an individual, so it's under his individual tax return and whichever, you know, marginal tax rates that he has, that's how it will be taxed. Any discount, Nick? Yeah, in this example, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with something called the 50% CGT discount. So this applies for all investments in, uh, that are capital assets and that applies to cryptocurrency as well. So if Joe, in this example, Joe didn't hold for 12 months, 
right? He sold uh, before 12 months was up. If he had have held that 0.1 Bitcoin for a period of 12 months and then he disposed, then his capital gain would have been cut in half. He would only have a capital gain of 20,000. So you can see this is this would have been a huge difference in the assessable income that he would have had to declare and much less tax that he would have had to pay as well. So that how exciting. about that? That sounds exciting. And should everyone just wait and hodl for longer than 12 months? Yeah, it's sort of the hodl strategy. It's like so attractive to go and, and aim for the 50% CGT discount. I would say it's something you always have to keep in mind because the tax outcomes are very beneficial for people who hold for long term. But as we all know, the cryptocurrency markets are also extremely volatile. So if you think it's uh, the right time to sell, um, then yeah, the tax, you know, the application of the 50% CGT discount is important, but it's no good to apply that if the value of the investment has dropped in half or, or, or is down even further than that. So we normally say to keep it in mind, but it's usually not the, the determining factor of when you should sell, of course. That's right. And we would like to share one little important factor. So you have to sell within, like you have to sell after 12 months. But what that actually means in practice, if you bought on 2nd of July, 2020, you must sell on the 3rd of July, 20, 2021. And that actually sometimes gets people because it's 12 months plus one day. I mean, it's eventually is 12 months only but it has to be fully 12 months by day. Yeah, that's right. This is a common trap that I've seen in a few circumstances. Uh, someone who's really passionate about getting that 50% CG discount. So for Joe in this example, he bought on 2nd of July, right, 2020. So he mm -hmm. waits till 2nd of July, 2021, and he thinks that that's the 12-month period, but it's not. If you purchase on 2nd of July, and it doesn't matter which time you purchased, it doesn't matter if you purchased in the morning or in the evening, as long as it falls into that date, the 2nd of July, then he has to wait until the 3rd of July in 2021, and then he will be eligible. Or he will be meet the conditions for the 12-month period to be eligible for the CGT discount. All right. We really... This is something that... We have heard a lot. A lot of people have come up with this concept. So I would say it's a little bit of tax R&D from the crypto community uh, to come up with alternative ways to maybe calculate the tax implications that they have. Uh, and this is a really popular one that I've seen um, people discussing. They call it the cash in, cash out method. I just want to say like very clearly and explicitly that this is not a real method in our tax legislation. You can't apply this, um, but we're going to go through it anyway to show you why it wouldn't apply it and why the tax outcomes would be very wrong if you did. Um, so it, it's sort of like the dream, like we sort of wish that maybe you could apply this as well because it would make life a lot simpler. But let's go through it and see what happens. So the theory of the cash in, cash out, as we understand, is I should only get taxed when I pull my profits off the exchange, right? Uh, I put some money in, I did all these trades over a period of time, and then I cashed it out. And whatever the difference is, well, maybe I should pay tax on that. And uh, let's see the practical example. So Joe takes his 10,000 Australian dollars, he puts it into the exchange, and he makes, he makes a, a purchase, and then he makes a, a sale. So that's a disposal. Then he purchases again and makes another sale and another sale. So they're also disposals. And then he purchases again. But it's all still on the exchange. So there's no money out in this scenario, right? And he doesn't even have any money at the end of this. He still has only holding cryptocurrency. But you can see each time he makes that sell trade, that's a disposal. And from our previous examples, that's a disposal event. That's an event where you will have to calculate the capital gain or the capital loss. If we were to apply this cash in, cash out method to this scenario, then I'm not sure what the result would be. I guess the result would have to be that there's no tax, right? There's no accessible income. But we know that's not true because there has been disposal events here 
you do have to calculate the gain or loss. And importantly, you know, one, it's it would be wrong to apply this, but it may not even benefit you to apply this. If you have realized the capital loss, for example, you would want to calculate that and you would want to declare it. So unfortunately, we can't apply the cash in cash out method. All of those sales are disposal events. You do have to calculate the gain and loss from each of those. You have to add them up and you do have to declare them. Yeah, though it may sound like a simple way or maybe a proper way, but it is not. And it's nothing about this in legislation. So you, you cannot apply this method at all. All right, let's look at the next big tax misconception. Um, this one is thrown around a lot as well. It's called the personal use asset exemption. By the way, this is a real exemption that exists. So this exemption exists because cryptocurrency uh, is considered property. Um, this is a ruling that the ATO issued, um, their interpretation of how cryptocurrency should be treated for tax. Uh, they said it was property and that it would be treated as a CGT asset subject to capital gains and losses. Uh, that basically fits into existing legislation that we've always had in Australia to, to treat investments like this. An uh, important side effect from this, um, you know, it's not like intentional or not intentional, it just exists. It's called uh, the personal use asset exemption. If you have a CGT asset, that's a personal use asset, that's an asset that you use for your own personal use. You know, it's not like used in a business, it's not used in investment, it's not used for any income producing activity, it's uh, for your personal use. Uh, the most common examples of this are things like you purchase a refrigerator for your household or you purchase a washing machine, right? These are all like uh, items of property, which would be a CGT asset as well. You can imagine how frustrating it would be for everyone to have to calculate capital gains and capital losses when they sell their refrigerator on eBay or Gumtree or wherever you sell it, right? Like it would be crazy. So because it's for personal use and it's lower than a certain threshold, you're allowed to basically ignore any capital gains or loss implications from that. And because cryptocurrency is also CGT uh, asset, uh, it is also eligible. Uh, you can look at this exemption to see if it applies. Cool. So the ATO has given some guidance um, they're given a very specific example as well, and it gives some guideline and insight into when you might be able to apply this. Because um, the reality is in most situations, you won't be eligible for the personal use asset exemption, but it's good to look at when it is eligible and maybe your activity or some of your activity does fall into that. And if it does, then you will actually be exempt from capital gains or losses. So this is a specific example uh, from the ATO. So let's look what happens. Uh, in this example, Joe, Joe has $270, or he's gonna take $270 from his, his bank account and he's gonna use it to purchase Bitcoin, an equivalent amount of Bitcoin, right? And he uses that Bitcoin and he sends it to a online uh, service provider who's selling event tickets in this case. So maybe he's purchasing tickets for, a uh, crypto event or a crypto meetup or, or in the ATO example, uh, tickets to a music concert. And he takes the, the Bitcoin and he sends it um, to purchase those tickets. And what's really important in this example is that he has to have done this all on the same day. So he purchases the Bitcoin, he sends it to the, to the ticket provider and purchases the tickets. And in this specific example, he would be exempt from having to uh, declare any capital gains or losses. All right. So you're probably thinking that's not maybe, you know, that's exciting or maybe it's not that exciting because the reality is in that short period of time, because he has to do it all on the same day, the value of his Bitcoin, although it is like quite a volatile asset, it probably hasn't gone up or down much in value during that process within that one day period. We have a question from Alistair Wang. She was asking um, uh, about uh, the purchase of Tesla. If you buy a car, a Tesla car with Bitcoin, clearly that would be over the limit of 10,000. And that means it will be never exempt as a personal use asset. 
Yeah, that's right. The exemption really only applies to smaller purchases. So there's a limit of 10,000. Uh, so if you purchase $10,000 of Bitcoin, you know, that's the limit. Uh, if you make a larger purchase than that, um, then you won't be able to apply this exemption. Right, we have a question about uh, first in, first out. This is something that we can actually explain. <clears throat> so because cryptocurrency is um, fungible assets in most cases, you have to check which one, uh, you should be able to apply entirely every method which is available out there. Particularly, we apply for our clients uh, first out for larger cost base which means lower tax out. Yeah, that's right. So uh, we have something called parcel identification method or it allows you to apply these strategies. Any of the strategies should be fine. Uh, there's some exemptions. You can't use uh, the, the, the weighted average. There's like a common method is the weighted average method as well. That doesn't apply in Australia. But you should be able to apply your FIFO, LIFO. Uh, we use something called lowest tax, first out. So that's sort of like an optimization technique. Um, you can also apply highest tax, first out. In some circumstances, people actually want to pay more tax in a particular period. Um, that's a form of tax planning. Um, potentially, you know, you have low income for that year. Maybe you want to put it, you know, into that financial period. So those methods should be fine, um, provided you're an investor. If you have, uh, you know, if you're a different entity type, you, you have to check if it's allowed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have a question from Kelly asking, are um, exchange fees treated as deductions? Well, that's a good question. And it comes to Kelly as well. <laughs> is Kelly an um, investor or a trader? So if Kelly is an investor, then exchange fees form the cost base of the assets that he's buying and when he's selling he's just reducing the proceeds of the sales hopefully that helps yeah so if we go back to the personal use asset exemption and you're wondering you know maybe it would still apply to me maybe you don't fall into that exact example by the ato but it's only one example there may be other situations where you could still be uh, eligible for this exemption. There's one really easy sort of question you can ask yourself um, to decide to sort of rule out in some way that you definitely wouldn't be allowed to apply it. And this is going to be true for the vast majority of people. And the question you can ask yourself is, when you purchase that cryptocurrency, why did you purchase it? Did you believe that it would increase in value? Or did you think that there was some reasonable chance that it would increase in value? That means that you purchased it for investment, right? So if you purchased it as an investment because you thought it would go up in value or you thought there was a chance that it could go up in value, you definitely wouldn't be eligible for the personal use asset exemption. If you don't fall into that category, it's possible you might be eligible, but you really would need to go through your specific circumstance to understand whether you would still fall into the criteria. That's right. And the ATO has been issuing private rulings in the past, which were before 2014, where they would actually exempt a lot of um, Bitcoin or Ethereum at that time. But now it's actually really changed. The view changed from 2014 and they've been closely monitoring and they know that it is, um, it's like investment. It's a new asset class. It's a capital asset. So the chance to get an exemption is really low. But you can always apply with a private ruling to the ATO to identify your particular situation. Yeah, that's right. Because this was... Um such a good opportunity for taxpayers to get a very uh, good tax outcome. It was a very popular um, area for people to apply um, either for, you know, specific tax advice from an advisor or to apply directly to the ATO for a private ruling to get clarity on this issue. 
unfortunately, because the tax outcomes were so good for the taxpayer, um, perhaps the ATO wasn't quite willing to go down that path. So we've seen that, yeah, the opinion of this has changed significantly. Maybe it's still possible, but if you really wanted to go down that path, uh, you basically will have to fight for that outcome and see if uh, you can pull it off. Hmm. And it's good that you mentioned fighting <laughs> with the ATO. You know, like I would like to actually mention that a lot of crypto um, investors and traders um, can be loud, you know, online about the tax outcomes. But when it comes um, to the individual circumstances and if we are trying to pursue something with the ATO and get the better tax outcomes, it does require a bit of fighting on your side, which means just proving your position. And there are not as many people who would wish to do that, unfortunately, and the development is happening slowly. But as with any new industry, you would see that large businesses would be fighting for the better tax outcomes. And that's how we drive better tax outcomes um, in Australia in many instances. So this is one of the things that if you want to help community, maybe lead the way and actually take to the um, most like high level of the judgment to the high court <laughs> to get the tax outcomes. It can be expensive. There could be costs involved. But this is what it takes to lead the change in the legislation and to drive better policy in the country. Mm. So now's the sort of most exciting part. And this is an area that we really like to advise people on as well. And that's opportunities to save on tax. So we know we have to pay tax on crypto. Um, we know a little bit on how to calculate that uh, if your capital gains, capital losses. But what if there's some opportunities, uh, some opportunities to save on the amount of tax that you have to pay? What sort of strategies could we look at? Um, well, you know, it's a pretty deep and can become quite a complex area. But what we've done is we've looked at three common things that we do. One is to eliminate taxes that you don't necessarily have to pay. The other is to split uh, your income into uh, different tax payers. And the other option is to also defer uh, or delay payment of your taxes. So these are sort of three common strategies. We're gonna do one idea on each. Um, hopefully some of them you may even be able to apply to your situation. You really need to review that and understand how applicable it is for you. Um, but let's have a look at how these work and, and keeping in mind that these are general concepts. And before we jump into saving on tax, I would like to highlight that, you know, there is every time you save a little bit, this is a big win. And you have to take that approach because we are in a highly regulated uh, environment for tax and tax is pretty high in Australia. But every little saving, like a couple of thousands, you should be celebrating and cheering because that's how it works. You add all little wins and you actually end up with a significant amount and don't buy into some scams when some men in white shoes told you that if you pay him or pay that person then you never pay tax again <laughs> this is uh, clearly a scam so in australia you do have to pay tax when you make a profit or if, when you make a capital gain it will be but there are some strategies and techniques that we apply and they're all, of course, legally acceptable. It's all about optimizing it and making it more efficient for you and for anyone in your family. So don't forget to celebrate little wins and promise that from now on, every time when you save like a couple of thousand, you actually really celebrate. And I'm going to show you. <laughs> no, it's so true. <laughs> no, you do have to celebrate the wins. <laughs> because in Australia, people do forget to celebrate little things because we are so busy and working hard. But this is how you do it. You accumulate your little savings from different strategies that we will share with you tonight. So I'm excited on this one. This one is um, eliminate. So what it means, you should not pay 
tax that you know it's possible to eliminate and never pay. And a lot of people in Australia don't really know that everyone pays Medicare levy tax. So you know, like those individual tax records for everyone, depending how much you make, this is where you fall. You have to always add plus 2% to those brackets because you, everyone pays um, Medicare levy tax, which is like 2%. But maybe only a couple of people who are on some visas and they're not eligible for Medicare levy, then that would be the case. But other than that, everyone pays Medicare levy tax, which is 2%. But there is also a Medicare levy surcharge, which is a different tax, which is related to Medicare. But you have to keep it in mind that there is extra tax. And it depends on your, uh, your case, but you may be a single or a couple. So you have to look into your brackets where your income falls into. If you are single, your income is over 90,000. This is the time when you can be paying Medicare levy surcharge, which can be as high as 1.5%. And if you're a couple, uh, then your combined income should be over 180,000. Then you should be looking into saving on that tax. And the simple uh, solution, which probably everyone all also heard about, is um, private health insurance with hospital cover. So you can get a basic one. You don't have to have any extras, but it must cover hospital. This is how you can save and never pay Medicare levy surcharge. Mm. Yeah, it seems it's pretty rare to have the opportunity to completely eliminate a tax, but when it's available, obviously, you know, this can be a very effective way. And where we're seeing uh, this situation at the moment, particularly with the Medicare levy surcharge, is, you know, you might have a, you know, modest salary that you're earning so that you wouldn't necessarily be over that 90K limit or 180K limit for a couple, but you have a large um, investment portfolio, large capital gains, which are unrealized that you're sitting on and you're thinking of disposing of them. And when you do dispose of them, that's going to add a lot of income to your tax return. That's going to put you over this limit, this threshold. So you maybe weren't thinking about it or completely aware that it exists. And then you're also going to be hit with the Medicare levy surcharge when you dispose of that portfolio. So this is a strategy that you can apply. If you don't know about it, you know, recommend to understand how it works and calculate one, you know, does it, uh, does it apply to you? how much you would have to pay and then see if it's worth for you to, you know, if you don't already to look at uh, the private health insurance um, to, to eliminate that tax that you would have to pay. That's right. You made like 1 million, you would have to pay 15,000 for medical levy surcharge. That's a significant amount. So you may better join the club, you know, for private health and have all those benefits for private health insurance and do not pay that 15,000. This is how it mm. works. Yeah, so if you're single and you're going, you're expecting income over 90K, you should have a look at this. Or if you're a combined income as a couple over 180,000, then you should have a look at this. And you can look and see if it's going to be worthwhile for you or not, but it's something to be aware of. It is a tax that can be eliminated. Right, and it can be also uh, important to know that every day is counted. So when you join in the middle of the year, you will be only allocating half of the year, like to be exempt and half of the year, you will still have to pay Medicare levy surcharge. So the earlier you join, the better. Right, the second one is about income split, uh, which sounds uh, quite exciting. And I'm excited about this one. And I hope you're excited as well. So the family trust is one of the common strategies and uh, something that you can consider. Of course, if you have a significant other, like your partner or your spouse, or even a family member that you get along with, you can consider to establish family trust. This is for uh, the best way why you want to have it is basically for investing. So family trusts are really good for investing long-term. So this is not for short-term gains. This is for long-term gains, the ones that you hold for longer than 12 months. That can be really good because family trust has this unique ability to split your income. 
So what it means, you can elect who will be the beneficiary of um, income every year, and you can elect the percentage as you wish. Technically, it can be, for example, yourself, like 100%, and let's say your partner is zero, or it can be 50-50 or 90-10%, and you can switch that every year. You can elect as a trustee or, or as a director of your company trustee. So the family trust is just a main entity to look at. The structures could be way more complicated and you should always get an advisor on board uh, to advise you about how it works, uh, to make sure that you are using it the right way. Because we've seen some clients will be making mistakes by not understanding the structure that they have and they would just misuse it. Um, so this is one of the important techniques. So if you have a family or significant others, you can actually split your income, let's say investing income. Yeah, that's right. It's sort of the ultimate inflexibility. So you get to decide where your gains and losses go or your profits go. Um, yeah, once again, this is for you to be aware that it exists. It's not a recommendation that you set one up because for a lot of people, it won't be appropriate. And that's because of the additional complexity to have a trust, a discretionary trust, and the additional costs to maintain it. So, you know, the accounting and tax fees for this uh, separate structure. So, you know, if you have a larger portfolio and you have, uh, you know, you're in a situation where you might benefit from being able to distribute profits to different members, then you could at least have a look into this to see if it's going to be beneficial for you. And another technique is the fair. So this is what we are talking about. It's about tax payable. So let's say you actually made that 1 million and maybe it was eligible for discount, maybe not. And you have some tax to pay. And in cryptocurrency, it can happen that you actually maybe don't have cash or not enough cash. Because you know, when you trade crypto to crypto, you can realize gains, especially if you're trading on a on the rise of the market, you can realize larger gains and not necessarily any losses. And then you can actually end up with a bigger portfolio in cryptocurrency, but with still no cash in the bank account. And you may have accessible income in that year to pay tax on. And in this case, we help our clients to defer their tax payable. So it's, you should know about this. It's available to you. The A2O can give you a permission to establish with them payment plan. So what that means that you can pay your tax over 12 months and that can be monthly, weekly or fortnightly. And you can actually have like a loan with the ATO when you repay your tax bill slowly. And there could be uh, interest uh, associated with that, but it will be allocated to your account. And if you do pay on time, so if you if you follow the schedule of the payment plan, then you can waive the, the interest charges. Mm. Yeah, so this is more common when there is a large portfolio, large amount of gains, which are now being cashed in. You result in a large tax bill that you're going to be liable to pay. This is a way, you know, you're not getting out of the tax bill. You, you still have to pay it. It just means that you have time to... Uh, you know, rearrange your portfolio as you need to to sell down those some of those assets so that you can meet that obligation. It just gives you time to to accomplish that. Right, and now we will be talking about different structure, which is a company, a PTY LTD. So this structure, again, it can be complex. It can have like shareholder, your family trust, or yourself as an individual, but not the best. So we do recommend to have uh, complex, more complex structures. This is like, you should look at this as a main entity structure. So the main entity is a company, PTYLTD. And companies are better for trading rather than investing activities. So if you establish, if you are actually a sophisticated trader and you've been doing really well for a while, it's uh, maybe a good idea for you, maybe not, you have to consider, to establish a company, PTYLTD. A company pays corporate rate tax, 
which is can be as low as 25% from the 1st of July 2021. You who, yeah, it is lower than the individual tax for sure. And companies have this unique quality that you can retain your profits from the company and you don't have to distribute. Like in the trust, for example, case you have to distribute income every year. With a company, you can accumulate your income and scale up your activity, your business. So this is a great um, saving way within time to buy you time to make more money. You have to be aware that 25% tax or 26 right now is actually for active income. So that means if your company been trading on cryptocurrency, that can be active income. But if you do receive some passive income, which is let's say um, you're doing farming and there is like yield staking, um, that can be like a passive income. If your company does only that, then it's passive income, it's, it will be taxed at 30%. This is, um, it taps into a complex uh, concept of base rate entities. But in any case, it is much lower than in individual tax rates in Australia. So it is a good strategy to save when we are looking at trading activities. That's right. So, you know, if you're an investor, you might look at a discretionary trust. Uh, if you're an active trader, uh, really like day trading actively, not holding for a long period of time, you may look at setting up a company uh, because of that ability to retain profits in a lower tax environment. Mm -hmm. That's true. And the last and the not the most least uh, is um, another structure which we quite commonly explain to our clients if they're interested in that and if it's appropriate for them. It's a self-managed super fund. So self-managed super fund is an exciting vehicle in Australia because you can actually pay the lowest tax rate possible and it's 15%. So if you are looking the lowest tax rate, you can look into self-managed super fund, but it may be not appropriate for everyone. And you do have to consider and do your own research or obtain an um, advisor on board so that you can actually evaluate if it's a reasonable and good idea for you or not. But if you do establish one, then um, this is the best retirement vehicle. Um, Self-managed super funds are good for establishing your long-term vision for your life. So you should not be looking at this as a temporary solution because, you know, even if you pass away, the self-managed super fund can be still around and do things. Mm -hmm. It's and really long-term, isn't it, the self-managed super funds? Yeah. It is very long term and you do have to know who you want to be with, um, let's say, if you are thinking to establish one, you can have other members like your spouse, your wife, your partner, maybe even family members. Sometimes people ask us if friends is a good idea. Well, I don't, we cannot really recommend that because you have to be with people that you're going to spend life with. So you have to be certain who are those people. And they have to have the same vision, you know, for your investing. And we are talking about cryptocurrency today. So we are talking about, is it possible, you know, to invest into cryptocurrency under self-managed super fund? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. But you have to make sure you're doing everything in the most correct way because um, self-managed super funds are highly regulated environment. And there are hundreds of rules and a lot of things can go wrong. But if you follow uh, like our recommendations, uh, we have a great article on this. Jump on our website and have a look on the articles. How to invest? There are like ten steps. How to invest into a self managed super under your self managed super fund into cryptocurrency. So there are a lot of things that you must consider. Your trust deed have to be aligned to allow for that, and you have to have an investment strategy which is uh, must be quite comprehensive one, uh, let's say that way, not a simple one, not some cheap uh, e-provider solutions for two pages. It has to be a comprehensive one where it explains why it's appropriate for each member of the self-managed super fund to invest into cryptocurrency. And it has to consider all risks uh, and liquidity and all storage, like everything. So it's quite massive task but it's possible. And then after that, you can engage um, with the digital currency exchanges and 
service providers and um, buy cryptocurrency, you have to store it in a wallet which belongs to cryptocurrency uh, to your self-managed super fund and never mixed up with your individual investments. This is like the rule number one. So you pay tax 15% on uh, short-term gains or any income and 10% on long-term gains, which are longer than 12 months. So super funds also eligible for discount, which is one third, not 50%, one third. Mm. Right, it sounds like we managed to get it on time. It's just my thing. Really well <laughs> yeah, we just skimmed so, through there. We'll go through a couple of questions. Oh, sorry, you go. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, hopefully, you know, I know there is so many questions coming in through the chat and questions that people have asked. So tax is it's a very broad topic. Um, everyone's situation is different and unique. So it's hard for us to uh, answer everyone's needs uh, through this presentation. Um, it, there's just not the time available to do it. So we hope that at least we've covered some of the topics which apply to everyone. Um, some things for you to think about as well. Hopefully it has answered some of your questions that you had. Uh, we're going to do this uh, question set now. So we'll go through some of the questions which have been coming through. Um, if at the end of that, there's still questions that we haven't answered, uh, that could be a few reasons because, you know, we just don't have time to answer every question which has come through, unfortunately. Uh, it may be that it's a very complex question. It's not a question that, you know, can just be given sort of on the spot and an answer provided because it really considers, you need to consider all the, you know, your situation in more detail about what's going on to provide advice on, on something like that. Um, if you do have those questions, you are able to contact us after or you can talk to you know your tax advisor that you have and, and ask them that, those questions um, and they'll be able to give you that advice or, or refer you to someone who can now look yeah um all good with that one so i just wanted to thank you guys for the presentation uh, that was great admittedly my brain is you know sore but uh, i don't think i've heard a crypto tax in in australia explained like that before um something that you know ought to teach in schools i think um, so very grateful to have, you know, some professionals like yourselves uh, dealing with the nitty gritty taxation laws that, you know, we face in Australia. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we'll just touch on a couple of those Q&A questions real quickly. Um, we'll just go through like five or so that we've had submitted before. Um, we'll get them out of the way, then we'll, we'll sort of wrap things up. If that's okay with you guys. Yeah, let's oh. do it. I'm excited. Yep. Okay, cool. So uh, question one here, does moving profit from one coin to buy another coin on a crypto exchange trigger a taxable event? Mm, this is like a crypto to crypto transaction, right? Sounds like. <laughs> mm. it's yes, yeah, it's a crypto to crypto, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a crypto to crypto. Um, or it could be a crypto to fiat as well, right? Like you could be uh, swapping crypto to US dollars or euro or, or whatever it might be as well. Uh, the trick to identify when the disposal has happened is to look at the original asset that you had. So let's say you started with Bitcoin and you decided to do a crypto to crypto swap uh, to another cryptocurrency like Ethereum. You, you had the crypto, you had the Bitcoin, it had its cost base, and then you got rid of it. It's gone. So a disposal has happened. If you had an asset and now you don't, that's a disposal. You know, it may be a different way that it's happened. You may have sold it, you may have exchanged it, you may have gifted it. Uh, you know, there's, there's different types of events. But if you had it and it's gone, that's the disposal that we're concerned with. So crypto to crypto is always going to be a disposal event that you'll have to calculate uh, your capital gain or loss or potentially uh, uh, income or expense as well. No, brilliant, Nick. Thank you. So um, another one here, is the crypto tax laws the same in every Australian state? Yes, they are. Yes, yep. that's right, because we have income tax and it's uh, on federal level. We don't file like state tax returns or anything like that, like in the US, for example. So we do have one system for all states for cryptocurrency tax. Mm, okay, nice and simple there, Marina. Thank you. So are there any instances where crypto gains can be classified as income instead of capital? Hmm. Yeah, this can certainly happen. So, you know, today we've talked about 
uh, CGT, right? Capital gains and losses. This is going to apply for probably probably a lot of people and maybe most people because they're holding for investment. But if you're an active trader uh, or maybe you're a, a business which has cryptocurrency, uh, then your activity you know, may no longer have that investment purpose. Um, and it can be taxed as uh, your profits and losses instead, like it's your trading stock. Uh, great. If there, uh, excuse me, this one's a bit hard. Is there any way to have a trading tax report directly and automatically sent to the ATO? <laughs> I love this one. Well, I think in the future it may happen, but at the moment there is nothing like that. You just send to the ATO your tax return where you declare your cryptocurrency gains, losses, or income. Or yeah, expensive. that's right. I wish there was an auto method, right? But um, yeah, yeah, make we have life a easier. Uh, that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> that's what we need. <laughs> um, if I'll just finish up on this one here, just because of time. Um, if I don't withdraw any earnings from a crypto exchange, do I need to pay tax? <laughs> mm. This is a good one as well. <laughs> well it's like a little <laughs> bit tricky, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good wish. It's a good wish. You do have to pay tax when it's derived. Say it's not about when you enjoy it, when you spend money, when you transfer money or invest it or done something with that. It's all about when the taxable event happened, then you calculate what happened. Say so it's not about withdrawing from the exchange, anything. It's about looking into transaction and identifying the taxable events and calculating what's happened. So it's likely that you still have to pay tax if you have some profit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's when the yeah. Happens. yeah. I had oh, a thank client. You, Marina. Um, uh, sorry, I just thought to share quickly a story. I had a client, let's say Jack, and he was like saying, "Oh, you know, our transactions are happening so quickly, like in a second or even like milliseconds. Do I still to have to count that as a taxable event?" And my answer was that you know, the split of someone who is running really fast maybe makes money in two minutes of his life because he's like running very fast and he's rewarded a lot. So time is not something that you can measure. So it's all about the taxable event happen. So you have to pay tax. Hmm. All right. So I'd say that's about time, isn't it, James? Yeah, no worries. So just before we wrap up tonight, um, we'll just announce the winners that we had for our giveaway as part of the masterclass. So um, congratulations to Matt Black 909, Stephen Tran Ox, and Clinch Mob. Um, please contact Hannah on the Binance Australia Telegram group to claim your prize. And also just a reminder that uh, we'll have our Binance Smart Chain Masterclass next Wednesday between 5 and 6 p.m. Um, with, that's AEST with our guest speaker, Tristan Hazelwood. So for more details of that event, please check out the Binance Australia Telegram, uh, Twitter, Facebook page, Binance Australia blog. Um, it's all there for you. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We've reached the end of the masterclass. And thanks again to Nick and Marina for such an informative session. Really appreciate it. Don't forget to follow Curve Attacks on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram um, to stay connected with them and reach out. So if you'd like to just wrap up any final words, uh, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll end this one now. I would like to say thank you. And it's been my pleasure to join tonight and share our insights. And I would like to answer one more question. <laughs> so there is a question from Samantha Bell. She's asking, are staking rewards incurred as income taxable real time or when it's withdrawn to AUD? Well, it's, it's actually taxable, it's ordinary income, and you have to count when it occurred. So that would be in cryptocurrency, not to AUD. Like to transfer that to AUD is another event which can be a capital gain or depends who you are. If you are a trader, it can be just a profit or loss that you need to calculate on. So good. I think that's a good note to end it on. Uh, if you do have uh, other questions, uh, you can uh, contact us. We can set up a consultation. If you have a list of questions that you want to know answers to, 
and to receive that advice, uh, we can do that for you. Um, otherwise, you know, there is other resources. Uh, the next best is probably to look uh, at the ATO or an ATO website. They do have a good article on some of the high level, um, you know, crypto tax implications. You can have a look there as well. And yeah, good luck everyone with their investments. And hopefully we will be seeing you because you've made some large gains or, or profits and we can help you sort all of that out. Brilliant, guys. All right, have a lovely night. Been a pleasure meeting you too. Take it easy. All right. Yeah, everyone.